All right, looks like we're live on YouTube. Plan, we are we ready? We're ready to go, Mr. Chairman. YouTube. And we're recording. Yes, we're live on YouTube and we are recording. So I think we're ready to go, Mr. Chairman. Plan, we are we ready? <laughs> we're ready to go, Mr. Chairman. YouTube. Sounded like we got some feedback off of YouTube. Then, yes, so. we're live on YouTube and we are recording. So I think we're ready to go, Mr. Chairman. We are hearing an echo. We ready? <laughs> we're ready to go, Mr. Chairman. YouTube. I like we got some feedback off yeah. of YouTube. Then, yes, so. we're live on YouTube and we are recording. So I think we're ready to go, Mr. Chairman. We are we're hearing an echo. Ready? <laughs> we're ready to go, Mr. Chairman. YouTube. Feedback from you. I'd like we got some feedback off yeah. of YouTube. Then, yes, so. we're live on YouTube and we are recording, so I think we're ready to go, Mr. Chairman. We are we're hearing an echo. Ready? <laughs> we're ready to go, Mr. Chairman. YouTube. Feedback from you. I'd like we got some feedback off yeah. of YouTube. Then, yes, so. we're live on YouTube and we are recording, so I think we're ready to go, Mr. Chairman. We are we're hearing an echo. Ready? <laughs> We're ready to go, Mr. Chairman. YouTube. Feedback from you. I'd like we got some feedback off yeah. of YouTube. Yes, so. we're live on YouTube and we are recording, so I think we're ready to go, Mr. Chairman. We are hearing an echo. Ready? We're ready to go, Mr. Chairman. YouTube. Feedback from you. I'd like we got some feedback off yeah. of YouTube. Yes, so. we're live on YouTube and we are recording, so I think we're ready to go, Mr. Chairman. We are hearing an echo. Ready? <laughs> We're ready to go, Mr. Chairman. YouTube. Feedback from you. Okay. Okay. Stop. Sounds like we've okay. lost the echo, so we will go ahead and start out. Okay. So welcome to this virtual Metro Plan Orlando TISMO meeting. I would like to call this meeting to order. My name is Doug Jamison, and I will be chairing the meeting today. We also have a team of folks working to ensure that this meeting runs smoothly. Today's meeting was advertised on Metro Plan Orlando's website and social media, as well as through targeted emails. Florida's Sunshine Law typically requires a quorum to be physically present in a room for a government meeting. However, Governor DeSantis suspended this requirement in an executive order, allowing government boards to conduct business using virtual meetings. This order has been extended through the end of September. We will keep our microphones muted unless we've been recognized to speak, and we're going to use the raise hands feature to participate in discussion. There are two public comment points in the meeting. Members of the public who want to speak will use the raise hands feature found on the participants tab. If attending by phone, you can hit star nine to raise your hand and request to be recognized. When you are called, your microphone will be temporarily unmuted by staff, and we will ask you to state your name and your contact information for the record. We have also accepted comments by email and phone message before the meeting. Guidelines for public comments are posted at metroplanorlando.org slash virtual meetings. We want this and all future online meetings to be accessible to all. Participants may join by computer, tablet, or phone. If you need accommodations to participate in the future, please contact Metroplan Orlando. Today, we would like to conclude this meeting as close to 930 as we can to allow Metro Plan staff to transition to the TAC meeting, which follows. I'm asking our presenters to please keep this goal in mind throughout the meeting. I'd also like to extend our thoughts and prayers to those who are being affected by Hurricane Laura. We're thankful it did not hit our area, but having been through these, we're certainly mindful of those who are going through them. Final statement that I'd like to make is that we are seeing a lot of statements that are being made nationally regarding the issues of social justice and in some cases injustice. These issues are now in the spotlight, but this is not a new problem. We are becoming aware not only of the major news breaking stories, but also how decisions have been made historically in our economy, our governments and our educational system that have sometimes affected people disproportionately. I would like to ask the TISMO committee to join me in pausing our meeting for the next 30 seconds so that we can reflect on these issues, how we can contribute to finding solutions and how we can begin to see things through somebody else's perspective. So I would like to ask that we pause for this next 30 seconds.
Thank you, committee members and guests. I'd like to ask you to please make sure that you have your cameras on while we are discussing issues in our voting. At this time, I would like to recognize Mr. Eric Hill of Metro Plan Orlando staff for agenda review. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, committee members and guests. Uh, thank you for working with us as we conduct these virtual meetings. We appreciate your patience and understanding. And along with that, Mr. Chairman, I'm grateful to hear your words of expression on the issues that are occurring in our country and making us mindful of our responsibility and how these, how we are fortunate that a lot of these things, um, especially the storm, and the impact that it has caused, uh, haven't affected us um, at this time. At this point, I can't really tell you today what our next meetings will look like. We're seeking board direction on how committee meetings will be conducted through, through the end of the year. We will be in touch well before our next TISMO meeting in late October to update you on how the meeting will be conducted. Again, thank you for your flexibility during this time. And that's further extension is granted to the, from the governor's executive order, excuse me, unless further extension is granted to the governor's executive order, we expect to have our next cycle of committee meetings, committee and board meetings in person in October. We're looking at the best ways to do this safely, observing proper health guidelines for our board and committee members, our staff and the public. Beyond that, I can't really tell you today what our next meeting will look like. We will be in touch uh, before the, the, TISMO, the next TISMO meeting in late October uh, to update you and to share our procedures for visiting the office in the future. Again, thank you for your, your flexibility during this time. For, for today's meeting, we'll be using the raise hand feature to recognize committee members during the meeting and to call on members of the public. During the, during the comment time. If you have joined us on the phone only without the video screen, please use star six to mute and unmute your line. Please use star nine to raise your virtual hand so the meeting host can see that you wish to be recognized. You'll see that there's a chat feature on your, on your toolbar. This communicates with all panelists in this meeting, which includes committee members, staff, and presenters. Please only use this <clears throat> Excuse me, please only use this if you are having difficult diff technical issues or need assistance. A full record of the chat comments will be included with the public record of this meeting. Also, I wanted to mention that at our October meeting, the 2021 20, meeting calendar will be on the agenda, <clears throat> excuse me, as an action item. <clears throat> The May, 20, the May 2021 TISMO meeting is currently scheduled for May 28th, which is Memorial Day weekend. So please be thinking about whether, <clears throat> whether you want to keep it at that date or move the meeting to May 21st, first, if that fits everyone's schedule. Mr. Chairman, that completes my announcement this morning and there are no changes to the, to the agenda. Now I would like to take uh, attendance. I'll ask Ms. Lisa Smith to call the roll so we can confirm a quorum for the meeting. Good morning, TISMO members. <clears throat> if you could please um, go ahead and unmute yourselves now for the roll call and you can go on mute again after your name is called. Please make sure that your video is on if possible so that we can confirm that it's you. You'll find your mute and unmute buttons the video buttons on the bottom left side of your toolbar. Please say here or present when your name is called. Brett Blackadar. Present. Cade Broad. Present. Jeremy Crow. Present. Kelly, Kelly Brock. Here. Scott Brown. Here. Michael Cash. Here. Crystal Clem. Present. Hazem El Hassar. Present. Brad Friel. Nassim Gondor. Present. 
Eric Gordon, Glenn Hammer, Brian Homiani. Present. Doug Jamison. Present. Jean Dredge. Here. Carl Kelly. Present. Steve Krug. Here. Amy King. Present. Alex Laffey. Present. Kathy Lee. Here. Butch Margraff. Present. Lieutenant Brad McDaniel. Nabil Muhaisen. Present. Lee Pulliam. Here. Pam Richmond. Present. Brian Sanders. Here. Rachel Giranella. Ramon Sonorans. Here. Shad Smith. Present. Alyssa Eady. Present. Sarah Walter. Present. Charlie Wexel. Present. Mr. Chair, we have a quorum. Thank you, Lisa. We will now hear public comments on today's action items. If we have people who want to speak on any of the action items, please use the raise hands function found at the bottom of your screen or pressing star nine on your phone keypad. When you are recognized, the host will unmute your microphone. You will see a pop-up that says the host wants to unmute you. Please accept that prompt to activate your microphone. We ask you provide your name and address for the record, and please hold your comments to two minutes or less. Are there any comments at this time? Mr. Chairman, we do not have any comments. Were there any written comments related to action items that were submitted before the meeting? No, we did not receive any. Okay, we have five action items on our list today. The first action item is the approval of minutes <clears throat> from our June 26th meeting, which are in tab one of your agenda packet. I'll ask to please use the raise hands function and let us know if we have a motion. And I see a bunch of hands. So the first one I see uh, is Shad. I move to approve the minutes. I also see a hand from Crystal Clem. I propose a change to the minutes. I was not present at that meeting. However, my alternate, Stephen Noto, was present. Okay, Metro Plan. I, as amended. Mrs. Shad Smith, I'll take that as amended. So Shad has the uh, first. And pardon my clock in the background there. Do we have a second? <laughs> that sounded like that was a second. It's <laughs> uh, how's I see your hand up? Are you a second? I'll second. Thank you very much. So we have the motion in a second. Do we have any discussions? And not seeing any, we will go ahead and take the voice vote. So please make sure that your microphones are unmuted. I will ask for all in favor to please say aye. 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 All opposed? And not hearing any, motion passes. Our next item is the FDOT amendment to the FY 2020-21 through 2024-25 Transportation Improvement Plan, or the TIP. This is found in tab two of your agenda. Mr. Keith Kasky from Metro Plan Orlando will be presenting the information. So please hold your questions on this action item until the presenter is finished. And go ahead, Mr. Kasky. Okay, good morning. Uh, this amendment includes projects that had funds that were originally programmed in fiscal year 2020 and last year's TIP. And those funds were not committed by the end of the fiscal year on June 30th. And so they just roll forward into uh, fiscal year 2021 and FDOT's new adopted five-year work program so we have to amend our TIP to include these projects so it'll be consistent with the work program. And as many of you know, this is a routine procedure that we go through about this time every year. And the roll forward uh, information from FDOT is in tab two in your packets as the chairman mentioned. So unless there's any questions, uh, we're asking for your approval of the amendment. Do we have any questions for Mr. Kasky? Please use raise hands. Mm -hmm. 
We have a hand. We have a hand. Chad, do you have a question? No, I do not. I was going to move to approve this. Okay, uh, so I think uh, action. So, Chad, we have a motion. Nabil, do you have a question that you didn't get in, or are you seconding? I have a second. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Not hearing any. I will go ahead and ask you again to unmute your microphones. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And hearing none again, the motion passes. Our third action item is another FDOT amendment to the FY 2021 through 2024 25 Transportation Improvement Program or TIP. Mr. Keith Kasky will also present this item. Please hold your questions until he is done. Mr. Kasky. Okay, well, this, uh, this item is pretty similar to the first one. This is uh, SunRail's version of their roll forward report. And these are SunRail projects that had funds that roll forward from 2020 to 2021. So again, we have to include these projects in the TIP to be consistent with the work program. And uh, that information is in tab three in your packets. So uh, we're asking for your approval of this amendment as well. Any questions from the committee, please use raise hands. Chad Smith. I move to I move to approve this item. See, so we have a uh, motion by Chad Smith. Do I have a second? I'll Ramon, on second. Have a first second. Do we have any discussions? Scott, do you have a comment or just a late hand? Scott Brown. Are you, I think you. No, it's uh, just kidding. Okay. Okay. No other discussion. And so we'll go ahead and go to a vote. Please make sure that your microphones are unmuted. All in favor, please say aye. 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 And any opposed? And the motion passes. Thank you. <laughs> Our next item is a readoption of fiscal year 25, 26 through 2039, 40 prioritized project list at Feb 4. Mr. Nick Lepp of Metro Plan staff will present the information. Again, please hold your comments or your questions until he is completed. Mr. Lepp. Good morning. Uh, we're looking for a readoption of the project priority list to include a line item for our UPWP. Uh, every year uh, under either special projects or data collection, we take some TMA funds and put them in our UPWP to perform these uh, local project tasks, uh, like the mobility plan for the town of Oakland and currently the Bell Isle transportation study. Uh, we're adding this to the project priority list to add more uh, linkage for project programming. Uh, none of the previous rankings that this board um, or committee uh, approved in July uh, have changed or the projects. So all are still uh, within the same draft uh, ranking order and proposed for funding. This is just a line item that we have already pulled out of the budget, but we're putting into the project priority list for the first time for better linkage of programming. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. And do we have any questions? Please use raise hand. I am not seeing any questions, so I will ask if we have a motion. Nabil. I do have a question this time. This is? Chad Smith, I have a question, Chad. please. Chad, go ahead with your question. Hey, the, um, Nick, on the program score, I'm on page 19, um, the multimodal system projects, and the first group of five projects don't have a score. And I don't remember why that is, and I was kind of curious about that. Um, I don't have it up on my screen, but if I, off the top of my memory, if they don't have a score, which means they already have a phase funded in the TIP. Okay. So they're, they're already receiving funding to go on to the next level. Um, we have top rank priorities for that next phase or that new project will, that will go into the work program or the next fifth year. Well, a lot of the projects have a, the next phase funded. So do they, do you reprioritize them or do you keep them in this order? 
if they've already had a phase funded in the TIP or the, we do not reprioritize. Our first priority is to complete those projects through construction before we bring a new project into uh, the fifth year of the work program. Okay. We just have a couple projects, but they're not necessarily in the order we would want them to occur. So I guess I can work with you in that in the future on trying yeah. to <clears throat> Yeah, that. we can discuss that for the next one. Uh, we are doing a new um, performance-based planning prioritization process through the MTP. Um, so we will have new scores and rankings for the next one. We will try to coordinate with the local governments on their priorities, but based on that mandate coming out of the FAST Act, we've got to do it data-driven. So we may not have the exact match of priorities, but it's something that we can work for, towards for implementation. Thank you. With that in mind, I do move to approve this item, the readoption of the 2526 to 3940 prioritized project list. The PO, I see your hand. Did you have a question or a motion? Uh, move to uh, second the motion. Okay. So we have a motion. We have a second. Is there any discussion on the motion? And not hearing any, I will go ahead and raise it for the vote. All in favor, please make sure your microphones are not muted. And all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And not hearing any, motion passes. Thank you. Our final action item is the approval of updated TISMO bylaws that are found in tab five of the agenda packet. Miss Virginia Whittington of Metro Plan Orlando staff will be presenting this information. As with the previous items, please hold your comments until the end. Virginia. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning um, to all TISMO committee members and those joining us. Um, virtually here. Um, today is a review of the proposed bylaws changes for the TISMO committee. The purpose of this presentation is to review the changes that are being proposed by staff and also to receive your recommendation to the Metro Plan Orlando board. Periodically, the bylaws of each of our advisory committees as well as the internal operating procedures from the Metro Plan Orlando board our review to ensure that they are consistent and up to date with the way that we are conducting business. This um, review actually resulted from the strategic uh, plan that is being implemented that Metro Plan Orlando Board approved last year. Um, so what you will find um, is a stricken and underlined version in your agendas at tab five. And I'll just briefly go through the changes that um, are are being presented today. And I will note that they are very minor changes. Um, the first is a universal revision. Um, any place the word chairman is used throughout your bylaws has been changed to chairperson and consistent with the update to the 2045 MTP now. We have proposed changing the long range transportation plan to MTP. Next slide, please. Under section two found on the first page of your uh, bylaws, the third paragraph, we have added a reference to ACEs or automated connected electric and shared vehicles to the list of disciplines that are outlined there. Um, on page two, section three under purpose, we've added roadside units um, as well to paragraph F. And under section four, membership and appointments. We've removed the Osceola Expressway Authority, as you know that they are now part of the Central Florida Expressway Authority. Next slide, please. Under section five on page six of your um, bylaws, we have uh, corrected an oversight that was in your bylaws from previous um, editions where the officers who are elected each year will assume their duties at the first meeting of the new calendar year, as opposed to immediately upon um, the adjournment of the, the meeting where they're elected, uh, as they are required to go to the Metro Plan Orlando board meeting. 
And so this is just making that correction. And also we have proposed to remove the reference to Regional Leadership Council. This is a subcommittee of the Metro Plan Orlando Board, which the chair and vice chair previously served on. And this committee or council is being recommended to be dissolved as a part of the update to the internal operating procedures at the board level. Under section seven, which is on page seven, general policy, we corrected a typographical error that was there. It had previously mentioned the board uh, and committee structure was six and it's really five. So we've recommended that change. And also we've added a paragraph to section 10 um, of the bylaws, paragraph C, that addresses the ability for staff to initiate um, updates such as this one, which results in um, administrative or changes that would result from other occurrences such as the strategic business plan. So with that, um, next slide. This, this concludes the um, revisions. I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm looking for a recommendation of approval to the Metro Plan Orlando Board. Chad, I see your hand raised. Do you have a question? Yes, the change from the LRTP to the MTP, you said, was that dictated by somebody else or was that just something you wanted to do? It seems like LRTP is a real well-recognized term that would appear appropriate for especially somebody who's a layman to the whole thing. Yeah, this, um, Nick and his team will probably be better to respond to that, but I think this is consistent with what is being used um, in other in other places, Nick? I can address, <clears throat> yes. Um, actually, with the update to the federal legislation, they changed the name to Metropolitan Transportation Plan, okay. which is why we've changed it for this next update, and we're just changing it in our bylaws to be consistent. Because um, a lot of local governments are also now using Long Range Transportation Plan, and now it can distinguish itself. Oh, OK. Makes sense. Thank you. Awesome. Do you have a question? Uh, just want to make a motion. Approve. Okay, we'll hold just Thank a second you. on that motion. I want to find out. Scott Brown, you have a hand up. Did you have a question? Second the motion. Okay, Still so Hazem, since we'll just go ahead and open, can you make your motion now? Awesome. Oh, okay, I'd like to make a motion. Motion to approve this item. Okay, and Scott, do you have the second? Sunk it to a motion, the uh, updated bylaws. Do we have any discussion on the motion? Not hearing it, please unmute your microphones and I will ask all in favor of approval, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> and not hearing any, we have approval and we have clock timing also. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> and of course it's nine o'clock, so it's gonna go on. So. <laughs> so in your agenda, you are, will see that we have a presentation that is coming up by Mr. Eric Katz on the statewide non-motorized traffic monitoring program. Mr. Katz, I will go ahead and turn it over to you and we have 20 minutes, please proceed. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for the invitation to join you all today, and thank you for your time. Again, my name is Eric Katz. I am the uh, non-motorized traffic monitoring program coordinator, um, and I work uh, for the Transportation Data and Analytics Office in FDOT, located in Central Office in Tallahassee. Uh, the TDA office has historically been responsible for managing the motorized traffic monitoring program for FDOT. Uh, there are a total of 350 continuous counters counting motorized traffic around the state of Florida constantly. Um, and in addition to the continuous counters, meeting counters that count 24-7, 365, we have thousands of short-term counters that are strategically placed throughout the state, which are um, very key uh, is to make sure that we report that data to FHWA. This is data that helps establish the very important annual average daily traffic uh, statistics, which are used throughout the state uh, for planning and engineering studies. So now the, uh, we are now completing our second year of the program and the TDA office now has the daunting task of creating a statewide program 
for non-motorized traffic. So we are two years old. We are now just uh, getting into our going past infancy stage, uh, still developing our program. So today I want to provide an update on where we are with the program. And then we'll end it with a partnership opportunities. I'll provide detailed and an answer any questions in regard to what the partnership entails. So I'm trying to switch the slide. Okay, oh, too fast. I'll try one more time, it's very sensitive. Okay, so for the agenda, uh, we have broken our program into four main parts. Uh, we have our continuous count program, we have our short-term count program. Everything that we collect will go into a public-facing non-motorized data repository, which everyone in the public will have access to. And then we also have ongoing outreach. Uh, an example of me here today is to make sure that the state is up to date on where the program is and offer uh, any partnership opportunities that there may be. So starting with our continuous counters, as I mentioned, uh, we're just about two years old. So we now have a total of four continuous counters. I mentioned the motorized programs got about 350. Uh, so we're still very young. This shows you the uh, exact locations of where these counters are located. Uh, we are, our plan is to be able to um, successfully install one to two continuous counters per F dot district. There are a total of eight F dot districts throughout the state, if you're including Turnpike. Uh, so we are going to be installing one to two per year, and we want to make data-driven decisions on where these key counters are going to be placed. So we're going to be using our short-term counters to help us make those decisions. So two are in Miami-Dade County, one is in District 7 in downtown Tampa, and then we have one in Tallahassee uh, on our St. Mark's Trail. So we have about seven more counters that are uh, due for installation. This first set of counters has been sponsored by uh, FHWA. They have a State Transportation Innovation Council grant, grant which uh, we were awarded $100,000 last year which would pay for the purchase and installation of one continuous counter per F dot district. So those selections have been made of where those counters will go. I can let you know that the district five counter, which is where Orlando uh, is located, that district five counter is going to be um, in Volusia County on the East Central Regional Rail Trail. That, so that will be the counter, the District 5's first continuous counter installation, and we will continue to move forward with installations as the program continues to grow. So I just want to quickly show you what some of the data that we've been collecting from our continuous counters. This gives you a sample of what is going to be public facing. This is not a final product yet. We're still developing this, but uh, it's very important that we not only show you the data, of what's available. Also make sure that you understand the context of the technology that's used so that you have a better understanding of the level of accuracy uh, that we can trust that this data is true. So just um, I'm showing here, this is our St. Mark's Trail. This is located in Tallahassee. This is considered the most popular trail in Tallahassee. And uh, I'm just going to go through here some of the information. Site name, St. Mark's Trail. Station number is a uh, when we start reporting this to FHWA, they all have a special coding that gives you the station number. Each site will have a, a Latin long, so you know exactly where the counter is placed. It's important that you know the facility type, the factor group, uh, F dot context classification. Is this an on-system facility? Is it off-system? Our program is currently flexible to, we're not just counting state facilities, we are counting all facilities uh, throughout the state. Uh, it's good to know if this is a Sun Trail facility or not, meaning FDOT helped fund the, the development, the either the management or the construction of this facility. Who's currently managing this facility? This one happens to be managed by Florida DEP. Uh, what type of count is this? Is this a short-term count or is this a continuous counter? This is being one of our continuous. 
what is the crown, the, what is the count uh, dates? So we installed this counter in May of 2018 and it has not turned off since then. So it continues uh, to count data 24 seven, 365. Very important to know the type of technology that's being used as we're learning, this program continues to grow. We're learning about different types of sensors have pros and cons into regard to the level of accuracy that they can provide. Um, regard to justification, uh, right now it's just very simple, trail traffic, trying to get an understanding of the volume that's going uh, up and down this trail every day. We do have raw data available that will be available upon request. So you can send that request to me and I can make sure you get the raw data. Uh, and we are still having to evaluate the um, the effectiveness of these counters. So we do have a camera validation count study that is gonna be in the works. We haven't done that yet, but we're gonna be placing uh, smart cameras at each one of these stations to uh, see how true the data is. So briefly looking at the results, this shows you when we installed the counter in May of 2018, and you can sort of see the trends on the level of bicycle pedestrian activity occurring throughout the trail. Uh, very interesting to see uh, the level of traffic has it spiked once COVID-19 occurred. You can see uh, that we had received higher levels of volume that we had ever seen on this trail since we installed the counter. Even when we had a drop in July, you could still see that that number was still above any other uh, of our peak season throughout the, the duration of this counter being there. So very interesting uh, to see how COVID-19 has been affecting uh, trail traffic, um, not just here, but you'll see in other parts of the state as well. So I, I took my time on that slide, but I'll be more brief. This shows you the other location. This is in District 6. This is a recent Sun Trail uh, construction uh, in Miami Beach, very, very popular area within Miami Beach. And this is giving us right now our highest numbers that we've seen throughout any of our counters. Uh, this is showing monthly trail traffic. We have bicycles reaching close to 30,000 bicycles a month, uh, which is very significant, very important data to share. Uh, good to know being that uh, FDOT helped pay for this trail. Good to see that those dollars are certainly being used uh, by the community uh, who are certainly are, are benefiting from the, the construction of this trail. Here's another example of a, our other counter in Miami-Dade County. This is on the opposite end of Miami-Dade County. This is right here hugging on the Everglades. This is the Chrome Pass. This is a recent state road uh, reconstruction. State Road 997 was reconstructed to include a shared path. Uh, so that sensor there shows you um, both uh, collecting bicycle and pedestrian traffic at this location. And you can also see the, the much lower numbers being that this is a rural location of Miami-Dade County. So you can definitely see the comparison versus uh, the very urban Miami Beach and the more rural section of Miami-Dade County. And then finally, we have the Jackson Street Cycle Track in downtown Tampa. Uh, this is a very important facility. This is the first fully separated bicycle, separated bicycle lane uh, that was constructed on a state road within the state of Florida. So uh, we had been getting recommendations anywhere we went in the state. This has been a very popular facility for the bicycle pedestrian community. We were always receiving recommendations to make sure that we got a continuous counter in place on that facility. So we absolutely did. Uh, also um, interesting to see that this is a downtown location. Uh, I think, um, if COVID-19 wasn't occurring and a lot of people were in this area going to work, using this facility for commuting, we'd probably be seeing some higher numbers. Uh, but we definitely think that COVID-19 is impacting uh, commuter traffic in the urban core of downtown Tampa. So that shows you the four counters that we have actively uh, installed, continuous counters uh, in the state right now. They are on right now, continuing to collect traffic. This shows you our criteria of our site selection. I mentioned this first round of counters had to do with our stick grant. Uh, this grant was written in partnership with the FDOT Safety Office. So part of our criteria was to make sure that we were doing site selection based on safety data. So we were using crash statistics uh, to help evaluate and 
um, narrow down our site selection. Beyond the stick grant, looking more at our transportation data and analytics criteria, we want to know what anticipated factor group would be like, is this a urban location, rural location, rural location? Is the trail traffic or is the commuter traffic? Is it recreational? Is it commuter? Is it something where uh, we're getting a mix of traffic patterns? That's important to know. We're looking for a mix of volumes. We're not just looking for the highest volume locations in the state. We're looking for highs, mediums, and lows for statistical purposes. So when we're getting recommendations from locals, we always emphasize it's important that we know where the high volume is, but it's just as important as to know where the low and the medium uh, traffic is occurring as well. It's good to know that we have a good understanding of what type of equipment will be placed. There's various types of sensors out there and the, the based on the facility type and the roadway characteristics is what helps us decide which sensor would be best. And as we've learned, some locations um, right now just are not feasible for equipment. Um, and I, I won't get into de the details of that right now, uh, but it's good to know which type of equipment would go in those locations. It's important that we evaluate that site on site uh, with the local agency. It's absolutely necessary that the local agency or the agency managing that facility supports uh, non-motorized data collection occurring. If for whatever reason they're not comfortable with it, we will not count there. Being that we're trying to make data-driven decisions on where we're gonna be installing continuous counters, if anyone has been doing any types of counts, uh, being a local agency or organization, and they have data, Metro Plan Orlando has already provided us access to many of their data they've already collected. That helps us very much and helps accelerate the impact and effectiveness of our program. And then as I'll get to in details in a moment, we have our own short-term count program, which has to do directly partnering with local agencies. And I'll provide some details on that in a moment. And then of course, it's good to know if this is a SunTrail facility or not. So this gives you an understanding of our site selection criteria. So moving forward in regard to continuous counts, we've completed our uh, site selection for the stick grant counters. We now need to finish those installations. Uh, we then need to validate the existing sites with smart camera validation. As I mentioned, we are working on a task work order to have some smart camera validation to be watching those counters and make sure that they actually is true. Uh, so that's going to be an ongoing uh, QA, QC process uh, throughout uh, the duration of our program. That's how the motorized program works today. We have staff constantly looking at each one of those motorized counters, looking at the data, making sure that uh, everything looks good. And if it's not, it's flagged and requires further validation. Uh, and of course, we are always looking for funding opportunities. We're a very small office with a very daunting task, a very large state that we have to count. Uh, so if there's any opportunities for funding or partnership with, or, with organizations and agencies, we're always, always open to that. So moving on, I'm going to be talking about our short term count program. Uh, and this map here shows you these dots represent everywhere that we've performed a short term count thus far. So this is really where we focused our energies in year two of our program. Uh, we're now stepping into year three, uh, and it's going to be a much more comprehensive deployment throughout the state, uh, working with each of our districts uh, and local agencies within those districts. This gives you a, a zoom in on what we've done in District 5 thus far. These were some short term counts that we performed uh, pre COVID. This was earlier in the year. We were partnering with our FDOT safety office who had performed a study uh, that was uh, locating some of the most what was considered to be some of the most dangerous bicycle and pedestrian corridors based on crash data. So we used that search criteria to help evaluate where would we be, where, where would we would be putting some short term counters. So this shows you the five locations within district five that we chose. So uh, location one, this is US 17-92 at South Street. This shows you two infrared counters on both sides of the street. They are pointing away from traffic. They are pointing towards the sidewalk on both sides of the street. And that is collecting what we consider a non-motorized count. These specific sensors do not classify whether it's a bicycle or pedestrian. We would have to have roadway tubes that we have uh, that would be placed 
at that same location. This specific deployment did not include the tubes. We just had resources at the time to use the infrareds. So that shows you uh, a typical deployment, a short-term deployment, what it looks like, where we have our sensors on both sides of the road. We're trying to get a complete count uh, as accurate as possible uh, for that facility. This shows you the results of that count. So you can see at that location, this was uh, February 21st, 20, 2020. And those counters were out in the field until March 5th. So as I mentioned, this is right, right before COVID, uh, or at least before the national emergency pandemic was announced. Uh, and you can see uh, those are the numbers that we were collected for that site. The other location in Orlando, uh, this is the Orange Blossom Trail at Amelia Street. Uh, so again, we have uh, infrared sensors on both sides of the road and they are counting non-motorized traffic moving up and down that sidewalk, uh, both sidewalks on both sides of the road. And here was the data that we collected uh, for that location. It was the same date, the same time. Uh, so just wanted to show you, uh, this is what the numbers came out uh, for that site. And this is gonna be similar so that when, eventually when this uh, data is made public facing, this will be something similar. So you'll be able to click on a dot on the map and then that data is gonna be available. So in regard to our short-term program moving into year three, uh, all of our counts are gonna be used, are gonna be provided on loan our counters. We have a pile of short-term counters right now. They're gonna be traveling throughout the state. So they're gonna be leaving Tallahassee's office next month. They're gonna be heading to Gainesville. And that pile of sensors, which is a total of 20 bike tubes and 45 infrareds are gonna be traveling district by district, month by month, working with local agencies. We're gonna be counting locations twice a year at the same locations so that we can get seasonality adjustment factors established. So what I'm gonna be talking about more in detail is the opportunity to partner with us. We have resources, our TDA office has resources to provide equipment. We could provide training on how to properly install the equipment, uh, but we are working and partnering with local agencies to help us deploy that equipment. Uh, we do not have the staff time availability to be able to uh, move up and down our very large state uh, constantly throughout the year. So what we are offering at the early stages of our program is loaning our equipment out to local agencies. And we can talk more in detail about what the, uh, that partnership entails. Uh, but we are just now going to be starting next this next month uh, our yearly deployment. So those counters will not come back to Tallahassee for a whole year. So it's very exciting. Uh, it's going to be a great, great program. Uh, so I will at the end of this presentation, I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, in regard to the partnership details. There is a memorandum of agreement that will be required. Uh, to uh, participate in the program. The memorandum of agreement is located on our website, which um, I will also share the, uh, the, the address for that. The MOA is about four pages long. It's not that, it's not that difficult. Uh, we, everything is fill in the blank, so you can just put your agency right in there. Um, once we get that signed and we have a understanding of where that equipment's gonna go, I can then reserve your equipment for deployment. In addition to short-term counts, which we're using with our loaner program, we've got a big state, it's massive, very daunting. 22s, 45 infrareds is pretty good, but it's still a small number when you're considering the scale of our state. So that's why our we are also taking data that anyone any agency has counted independently, you can share that data with FDOT. We will accept that data and we will then uh, process it into our non-motorized data repository. And this is going to be an example of what the public facing map is going to eventually look like. This is still in the development phases, uh, but this shows you everywhere that we've currently counted, both our continuous counts and our short-term counts. This will be a map that you'll be able to click. And as I've shown you on some of the other screenshots, you'll be able to get the data regarding those locations. So, as I mentioned, we are still working on developing that system. This is a new system 
Call, uh, the vendor is called MS2. And this is going to be what we utilize to validate data, report data to FHWA, and also make it public facing. So um, still in development. One of the exciting things about this uh, data management system is that again, it's not only able to process our counters, but we will be able to take uh, anyone else's counts and load them into the same repository so that the state can benefit from everyone's efforts collectively counting throughout the state, which is certainly going to help accelerate the, the impact of this program much faster than if it was just our office doing it alone. Eric, I want to make sure that we save enough time for questions. So okay. I want to give you enough time for your Yes, wrap -up. thank you. Wrapping up. So we have a website. Um, here you have all the everything. We're completely transparent in our uh, our program. So all of our reports, we have webinars. They're all there that you can click the link and get access to all that information. It's a very popular program. We've got over 550 people on email list that are tracking this program that we are actively working with our partners. And this is the end. So my question to the group is, are there any local agencies uh, interested in learning more about the loaner program and participating? Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me start out by opening the floor to any questions on the presentation. Chad, you are recognized. Yes, I am. Um... I had a couple questions. One is I saw on your counts you had shown mopeds and motorcycles. Was those people that are violating generally the trail or were they actually allowed? Um, I was kind of curious about that. Yeah, uh, good question. And yes, our sensors, our continuous count, count sensors are, are, these are very high grade sensors, very sensitive, able to classify beyond just bike and ped. And depending on the facility, so like Miami Beach, uh, we learned from our local experts that learning that there was many lifeguards and police officers going up and down on ATVs, going up and down that uh, shared path. So that is ATV traffic. Uh, in St. Mark's Trail, the vehicles are maintenance vehicles. Um, and also, it's supposed to be a non-motorized only trail. So being that motorcycles are caught, some of this is in a very rural section of uh, Leon County. And so after hours, it looks like there might be some people getting on there on their motorcycles when they shouldn't be. And then the rural section in Miami-Dade County, uh, it's by an agricultural uh, area. So it's farm equipment uh, with trailers that are going up and down that shared path. So interesting to see that based on the context of the environment, different types of uh, motorized traffic is actually utilizing those facilities. And when we do the camera validation study, we will have a much better sense about what exactly right. those does, vehicles are. Does that also pick up um, scooters? Yes. Or yes. do they show up as just bicycles or how does that work? The mopeds is would, would count as the scooters. The scooters, uh, okay. Yes, but we still need to do further validation and that's our camera validations. We're gonna make sure that what showed as a moped or a right. scooter is exactly that. Okay. And the other, one other quick question is, how many years was your grant from what, FHWA? This was a one year grant uh, that one we year. were awarded okay. last year. So uh, okay. it was about six, seven months of working uh, of site selection. Uh, my direct contact in district five is the bike ped coordinator, Stephanie Moss. So I've been working with Stephanie and I will continue to work with Stephanie. She will be my primary point person uh, when doing, when coordinating short-term counts in district five. Uh, it will be with Stephanie Moss that I'll be working with. Uh, I do also wanna mention that my manager, Joey Gordon, who's on this call as well, uh, he's who I report to and he's also involved with the program ongoing. Thank you. Mike Wilson, do you have a comment? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to mention that MetroPlan also has a pair of MyoVision cameras. Uh, so now MyoVision are going to be even shorter term than, than FDOT's short term, they're just 48 hour counts, but you can get a lot of detail out of that because it's video counting. And uh, yes. so for any, for any of you who need more detail, uh, particularly at intersections, for example, what kind of turning movements you're seeing, that'd be useful. Yes, and thank you, uh, Mr. Wilson. That is tremendous. And that is part of the uh, being able to, to establish data sharing partnerships with agencies. That's really, really what this program needs to be all about. As I mentioned, we're gonna be working as hard as we can to, to get as much coverage over the state as possible, but it took 60 years for the motorized program that FDOT is managing to 
to develop to the comprehensiveness that it is today. And I know none of us want to wait 60 years uh, for non-motorized data. So many thanks to Metro Plan Orlando. So they were they have been a supporter of our program since the very beginning. I met with Mr. Wilson on, on our first month uh, of getting this program started. And the fact that Metro Plan Orlando is uh, sharing data with us already, continues to share data, that's tremendous. And um, that's uh, part of our messaging throughout the state. In the interest of time, I'm gonna take one more from Jeremy Crow. You are recognized. Yes, thank you. Um, I had a question about what's the, like the, the, you mentioned, you touched on it a little bit, the end goal of this. Are you hoping to have um, like the same number of counters or like more counters than uh, you have of vehicle counters? Because with pedestrian volume, it's very, very site specific. Vehicles are not, it's a lot easier to have spread out, spread out stations, but to get an accurate picture of pedestrian data, um, sometimes it has, it changes on a block by block basis. How is DOT thinking of like planning to provide that level of granular data? That's a great question. And I think we're, we're still trying to figure that out. And that's a, that's a big question. That's like a, a national TRB level question. Uh, we are currently one of the first states taking on this daunting task of starting a statewide non-motorized program. There's only a few others in the country that are doing it. We are in active dialogue with the states, learning more about what their methods are. Uh, but I think as I touched on the, 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 the data sharing, is going to be very important, uh, especially when it comes to working with cities, uh, MPOs uh, that I would say are much more in tuned with the, the granularity of data. Um, we're going to have to be closely working with those agencies, and that's going to help us really spread out the amount of lo locations that we're going to need to be counting um, throughout the state. So. We're still in the very, very, very infancy stage of this program. Um, so I anticipate as the technology grows, um, we're learning that uh, camera data is becoming very popular. Uh, we know we have friends in traffic operations and other agencies that are also doing studies that we can now combine technology where cameras can do many things at once. So that's going to be part of it. Um, and yeah, I don't have a, a definite, definite answer on how we're going to do that. We, what we need to do is just get started. We just need to start counting and seeing the patterns and, and seeing the, the variabilities that are going to be shown as we go site by site. So uh, I'm sure by the end of next year, starting year four, I'll probably have a better, more comprehensive answer for you. But I agree, it's, it's a daunting task we have ahead of us, but we need to start sometime. So we're, we're, we're starting now. Thank you very much, Mr. Katz. As everybody can see, we have a question on the screen. I will ask that agencies that are interested, please make yourself known to either Eric or Mike Wilson at Metro Plan so that they can go ahead and forward that information. So thank you for your presentation. And we do want to move towards wrapping up our meeting. We want to save a little bit of time for public comments, but I will ask if any committee members have any final comments or if it's just they want to bang it up before we get to our public comment. If so, please use raise hand. And not seeing raised hands, we will move to our final public comment. If any members of the public wish to comment, please use your raise hand function and you will be recognized or dial star nine on your phone keypad. We will unmute your mic after you are recognized. Please state your name and address for the record and limit yourself to two minutes. I also understand that we do have a comment that was submitted. So we will start with any comments uh, through raised hands. We do, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. We have a comment from Joanne Canellas. Yeah, uh, I was, this is Joanne Canellas. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, Joanne, please proceed. Yes. Um, well, um, we need to have a bus and train, 24 hours bus and train service, including Saturday, Sundays, and holidays. And we need this, have this bus out here also at, you know, bus up at the William Street here as well. The one I just came from and I'm walking on the, on the uh, country club road right now. Okay, thank you, Joanne. We will make sure that comment is taken into consideration. Thank yeah, you very much. Yeah, because, 
We need it really, really bad because I'm sitting and sweaty when I'm sitting and walking as well. All right. Well, thank you for taking the time to call us. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Any... Goodbye. Do we have any other raised hands? And I am not seeing any. Mr. Hill, any comments <clears throat> submitted? Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, we do have one comment that was submitted to us uh, via email, and it is from uh, one of our members, uh, Mr. Butch McGrath, and uh, to whom it may concern, to whom this may concern, <clears throat> the um, email was sent on Wednesday, August 26th. Subject is uh, State Road 429, uh, August, August 20th, 2020. To whom this may concern. I have a concern for the State Road 429 Western Beltway. On August 20th, 2020, at approximately 6.20 a.m., I was riding motorcycle southbound from State Road 441 to I-4. I noticed when approaching the first three toll plazas, a sign stating pay, pay by plate. Easy enough to ride on the main road and pay by mail with the surcharge. I approached the second toll plaza and verified the overhead sign did say pay by plate. This is very convenient since my decal transponder is registered to my car. Great, tolls are converted, tolls are covered. Cruising along to toll plaza number three, my expectations are to pay by plate. While riding under the overhead sign, I glanced up and I don't see the pay by plate sign. I did notice a big $100 toll violation sign on the side of the road. It was too late to maneuver through the pay toll to the pay to the, through the pay toll plaza safely, so I continued on. I have not received the pay toll notice yet. I am still in South Florida. If toll invoice comes with the $100 fine, I am strongly objecting that this is unfair. My expectations of pay by plate were set passing by the first two toll plazas. I will know soon, but not by the TISMO and TAC meetings Friday, August 28th. I can address both meetings if needed. Thank you for your great work. Thank you for the great work you do. Butch McGrath, TISMO Community Advocate. Thank you, Butch, for submitting. Uh, ask if, I uh, don't want to put you on the spot, Brian, but do you want to address? Yeah, actually, if you could if you could send me that uh, email comment, I would appreciate it. We would, we would be happy to get back directly with uh, Mr. McGrath. Okay. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, Any other comments, Mr. Hill? That's it. Okay, I would like to remind our committee that our next TISMO meeting is in October. We do not have a September meeting schedule. So we will see you on October the 23rd. With that, we will go ahead and stand adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.